on. So let's talk about Zechariah. Read Zechariah chapter 9. And uh, I labeled this as uh, God, God redeems his people. So Zechariah chapter 9 begins the third section of the entire book of Zechariah. The first section was chapters 1 through 6. You remember the eight visions of Zechariah, which were all apocalyptic. They read like Revelation. The second section, which is chapters 7 and 8, are about four visions of ethical pro uh, prophecies. And in other words, how to act in light of what's coming. Here, sincerity and fasting are the main focus. So we study the first the first six chapters. We study those eight visions. We study the chapters seven and eight, talked about how to act because of what's coming. The third section, which we'll begin tonight, of Zechariah can be divided into two parts. Here we receive two visions, which Zechariah calls oracles. The first is covered in chapters 9 through 11. We'll start that tonight with chapter 9. The second of these oracles is from chapters 12 to 14. In chapters 9 to 11, it primarily deals with a Christ's first coming and uh, contains some of the most detailed accounts of the Messiah to come some 520 years before his birth. So we know that, Ze that Zechariah and Haggai began their prophetic ministry in 520 BC. He's going to prophesy of Christ's coming specifically. He's going to prophesy of one specific day in Zechariah chapter 9, which we'll tell you about. And that is actually almost 520 years before Christ was born. 550 almost before uh, the, the day he's going to prophesy. So this third section of Zechariah's book is truly amazing. When we see the details of Jesus, how he would fulfill in his first coming. The uh, second part, or the second oracle, chapters 12 to 14, deal with Messiah's second coming, yet to be fulfilled. So for the next several weeks that we study, we'll deal with the First chapters 9 to 11 of Jesus' first coming. Chapters 12 to 14 with Jesus' second coming. The Messiah, rejected at his first coming, is exalted, uh, is the exalted king of Jerusalem at his second coming. You'll see that as we end up in chapter 14. So here's how the book of Zechariah breaks down into three parts that I just told you. The eight night visions are chapters 1 through 6. They're apocalyptic. They're about the future, the horse patrol, four horns, the four craftsmen, man and measuring line. Joshua Clough, Lamps and Olive Trees, Flying Scroll, Woman Ifa, and the Chariot Patrol. And the four messages, the rebuke, the reminder, rest, restoration, return. We talked about chapter 7 and 8. Then the two oracles, which we're starting tonight. Jesus' first coming, chapters 9 to 11. Jesus' second coming, chapters 9 through 14. So let's begin chapter 9. First, let me give you a brief introduction to chapter 9 before we explore the verses. An overview, if you will. Zechariah chapter 9 looks forward to the establishment of the Messianic Kingdom. When King Messiah will rule over the earth, and his people Israel will be gathered and dwell in righteousness. The king who enters Jerusalem on a donkey, obviously his first coming, in verse 9, is the same king who rules over the nations in verse 10. The first and second coming of Messiah separate actually verses 9 and 10. So Zechariah is weaving bunches of it together, even in chapter 9. In the first eight verses of chapter 9, the enemies are of Israel are removed from the, from the coming of the king in verse 9. Many of these prophecies were fulfilled with the advance of Alexander the Great's armies, which I will give you some history tonight to show you how powerful this, this prophecy was before Alexander the Great conquered the Middle Mid East. So, which he brought down the Persian kingdom and the cities, which were enemies to Israel, including Tyre and Sidon and Gaza. Alexander granted the Jews freedom to worship. Really interesting. Jerusalem was never conquered by the armies of Alexander. By the way, Josephus notes that. At the end, I'll read you something I don't normally do. Josephus and his history of what Alexander did. Really pretty amazing. Parallels Zechariah right down the line. These first eight verses look forward to the day when the remains of the Philistines, I'll tell you who they are, will one day be part of Messiah's kingdom in the millennium. That's right, the descendants of the Philistine. The last part of this chapter looks to a day of the second coming when the Lord will establish the descendants of Jacob as the jewels of his crown. During this period, the Messiah went to Jerusalem on a donkey was rejected, who was rejected, who will rule and reign over the earth in power and glory. So let's begin in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. The burden of the word of the Lord in the land of Hadrach and Damascus shall be the rest thereof, when the eyes of man, as of all the tribes of Israel, shall be toward the Lord. And Hamath also shall border thereby, Tyrus and Zidon, though it be very wise. And Tyrus to build herself a stronghold, and he kept silver as dust, 
and fine gold as the mire of the streets. Behold, the Lord will cast her out and will smite her power in the sea, and she shall be devoured with fire. Lots of names, Hadrach, Damascus, Hamath, uh, Tyrus, uh, over and over, lots of cities. And yes, lots of confusion if you read this and don't know what you're reading about, especially if you don't know the history behind it. And you can get very confused uh, if you don't understand the prophecy Zechariah is putting forth. But if you do, it is extremely powerful, as you'll see tonight. Here we have to talk about world empires and kingdoms before and after Zechariah wrote his book. I need to give you the background of it. Remember this from our Daniel study, the image he translated from Nebuchadnezzar's dream? Do you remember this? He said Daniel lived in the uh, first kingdom. So there's going to be five kingdoms on the planet. The head of gold, which is Babylon, 660, 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. And he said Babylon is going to be destroyed by Persia. That's the, uh, that's the breast of silver. And then they'll be destroyed by Greece. That's as far as we'll go. The rest is prophecy. But Daniel's prophesying it in the, in the only first kingdom. He doesn't even know. He knows about all the rest of them coming prophetically. But he's not lived in them. It's all prof prophecy. So we know these five kingdoms represent five different periods. Head of gold is Babylon. Breast and arms of sword, media Persia, from 539 to 331. Remember, 520 is where Daniel is where Zechariah is writing. So he's writing in the breast of arms and silver. He's writing in that kingdom. The Babylonian kingdom is passed. It's been conquered. Nebuchadnezzar has been conquered by Cyrus the Great. You remember him? Well, that's this one. That's the chest of silver. Then, of course, the thighs of brass, Greece, will come from 331 BC to 168 BC. That's Alexander the Great, who will conquer, who will conquer Persia. The media persian empire so he's giving us we i want you daniel's telling us about these five kingdoms and i want you to understand that as we go a little further so daniel lives in the first kingdom babylon nebuchadnezzar was the king zechariah lives in the second media persian kingdom which is cyrus who conquered babylon but a third zechariah tells us is coming now it hasn't happened yet in zechariah's day he's living in the second kingdom but he's telling us about a third one and he is extremely specific on how it's coming Matter of fact, I get very excited being a student of the Bible and a student of history, uh, giving it, giving you this tonight because it'll pull both of them together. He's talking about the coming empire of Alexander the Great, the thighs of brass of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. This is over 200 years down the line in the future of Zechariah's day before it happens. Look, it says the burden of the word of the Lord. The Hebrew word root for this is Masah which means to carry. For example, the word of the Lord is a burden to be carried by the prophet to proclaim his message. It also means oracle. We get our English word oculus and ocular from this. It's a vision from heaven to be shown to man. When I visited Italy years ago with Cheryl and my family, we went to the Parthenon, the Pantheon, excuse me, the Pantheon in Rome. The Pantheon, Pan is all gods. It looks like this and in its center, it was built a long time ago. It's 2,000 years ago. There's a hole open to the night to the sky. From the inside, it looks like that, and you'll see the ray of light coming in. That's called the oracle. Around the interior of this are all different gods. The Romans didn't want to miss any gods, but they believed the light came down from heaven to these gods. That's an oracle. So when, when Zechariah is talking about an oracle, these two oracles, he's telling, this is directly from God. This is a light from God telling me exactly what's going to happen. Pretty powerful. Zechariah chapter 9 and 11 are part of that first oracle. And in chapter 9, he unloads a host of physical locations. Now watch. The areas and the cities mentioned are specific for a reason, which I will shortly share with you. Let me share the locations first. And again, a casual reading of Zechariah, you'll miss all of this. You have to dive deep to get this. So he talks about land of Hadrach, Damascus, Tyrus, Hamath, Zidon. And so he's talking about these specific cities. Hadrach is an area north of Damascus. Damascus was part of the same area, obviously, as Hadrach. Hamath is a city located 125 miles north of that area of Damascus. And Tyre and Zidon are located on the Mediterranean coast. These two cities are often mentioned together in Scripture. Both were prosperous trading centers, which bartered with other cities throughout the Mediterranean. Here, Zechariah notes their wisdom. They are located about 20 miles apart. They're also in the New Testament. High traffic port cities of the Mediterranean. Very prosperous cities. Tyre and Zidon in the ancient land of Phoenicia. Today it's Lebanon. So he also says Tyre was built. 
It says, and Tyrus, Tyre, do you build yourself a stronghold? Heap up silver and dust and fine gold as the mire in the streets. The city of Tyre was known as Stronghold, which was able to resist mighty kings because part of the city was located off the coast, built on an impregnable and impenetrable rock. Not until Alexander the Great built a causeway from the mainland to the inland city did it fall, fulfilling the words of Ezekiel chapter 28 and Zechariah 9 3. Here's what Alexander the Great did he built a causeway from the mainland. He built this so he could conquer Tyre. That's what he did uh, when he conquered the world. So Ezekiel also notes the wealth and the glory of Tyre, which the Lord used to illustrate Satan's pride before his fall. It's a symbolism also of Satan. Hiram, again, I'm giving you history, but please follow me tonight because it's all going to make sense in a moment. Hiram, king of Tyre, is noted for his friendship with David and Solomon, and he provided cedar trees for the temple of Solomon long before Zechariah and long before Alexander the Great. 2 Samuel 5, 1 Kings 5, 8. But the city grew wicked, and the king of Tyre is also used as a picture of Satan in Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel notes the wisdom of the king of Tyre. He says that his wisdom is wiser than Daniel. Now, let me, let me give you a little side note. Wicked queen Jezebel was the great granddaughter of Hiram, who along with Ahab, king of Israel, resisted the Lord and his prophet, you know, Elijah in 1 Kings 16. So here's how Ezekiel makes the Satan connection to the king of Tyre. The word of the Lord came to me again saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyre, Satan, thus say the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, you said I am God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet art thou a man and not God. Again, back and forth from the man who's a wicked king and Satan. Though thou sit thine heart as the heart of God. Obviously, set thine heart. Obviously, Satan wanted to sit as God. Behold, you're wiser than Daniel. It's no secret that they can't hide from thee. With thy wisdom, with thy understanding, you have gotten the riches. It's gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. See the connection. Satan has actually allowed Tyre to prosper. And in their, in their prospering, they became wicked. You can see it in any great city that w goes away from God and trusts their riches. By thy great wisdom and thy traffic has thou increased thy riches. And thy heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Therefore, thou saith the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of God. And that's what Satan did, Lucifer, when he tried to ascend to God. Behold, therefore I bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of nations. This is physically upon the city, Tyre. And they shall draw their swords against thee, the beauty of thy wisdom. And they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to a pit. Thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. So a, 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 actually a woven in prophecy. But find out what it's saying. To find out what it's saying, let's go a little bit further. Tyre was a wicked city. It was a wicked city in, in uh, Zechariah's day. It was a wicked, they were wicked, Tyre and Zion were wicked cities in Jesus' day. So look what Zechariah 9, 4 says. It says, Behold, the Lord will cast her out. He will smite her power, Tyre, in the sea, and she shall be devoured with fire. Okay, now here's where Zechariah is telling us his listeners about these areas. It says he will cast her out. During the time of Zechariah, many of these kingdoms were under Persian rule. Tyre and Zidon were under Persian rule. Babylon was the world ruler. Persia conquered Babylon. So Bab Persia now is the ruler over Tyre and Sidon. So these cities are under Persian rule until, during Zechariah's time. So when Alexander the Great came and he marched against Persia, these cities were taken, including Tyre, after a five-month siege. They were closed after they closed the gates to Alexander's army. Jerusalem, on the other hand, enjoyed Alexander's favor and was not conquered by Greek troops. Greek troops, which passed by our walls. Alexander met the high priest, I'll give you the actual account later, of the temple and was shown the prophecies of Daniel regarding him. And as a result, he granted favor to the Jews. You're going to learn some amazing history tonight. The marching Greek armies were seen fulfilling the near-term prophecies, bringing down these proud city-states. All those cities, Hadrach, Damascus, uh, the ones at Hamath, those were conquered by Alexander the Great they will be conquered 200 years after Zechariah writes this, but he tells us about them. This is Alexander the Great who will conquer them 200 years later. And he's talking about Tyrus and Sidon. So this is what, what's going on here. And he says, now they conquered those. And listen to this so you understand what's going on. Zechariah says, another king's coming. Alexander the Great is going to conquer the world. He's going to conquer all these cities. But he's not going to conquer Jerusalem. Why? Because this is preparing the way for the Lord. We know that the 
that the temple of Solomon had to be rebuilt so Christ could come into it. So Alexander the Great would have would have destroyed that temple. They already had gold in it. They already had all the things that were coming back from from um, exile. He never conquered it. Why? Because Christ was going to come into that rebuilt temple. Now it's going to be rebuilt by Herod, but they're going to use the same things that are there. So had he conquered that, Christ would not have been able to come. There wouldn't have been a temple there. Herod wouldn't have no reason to build it. The Jews would have no reason to build onto it. So Zechariah is allowing them to rebuild the temple, encouraging them. If Alexander came and destroyed Jerusalem, as well as all the other cities, which he should have done, he doesn't do it. And Zechariah tells us that he doesn't do it. Now, he says that, look at the next ones he conquers. Ashkelon shall see it. They're going to get conquered. Gaza shall see it. This is south of Jerusalem. Ekron, for her expectation, shall be ashamed. The king shall perish from Gaza. Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. And a bastard shall dwell in Ashdod. I'll tell you about that. It has to do with the Philistines. I'll cut off the pride of the Philistines. I'll take away his blood out of his mouth and his abomination between his teeth. He that remains, even he shall be for our God. He should be a governor in Judah. So Judah will be left okay. And Ekron has a Jebusite. I'll encamp about my house because of the army. God says, I'll protect Jerusalem uh, because of Alexander. Because of him that passes by. And Alexander passed by Jerusalem. And because of him that returns, no oppressor shall pass through her anymore. For now I have seen with my eyes. Now, powerful, powerful statements. Listen to it. Ashkelon, following a southern route from Hadrach, Damascus, Hamath, Tyre and Sidon, along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, the city of Ashkelon follows. The Eastern, Eastern Bible the Dictionary writes the following about Ashkelon. Ashkelon was one of the five cities of the Philistines. It stood on the shore of the Mediterranean, 12 miles north of Gaza. It's mentioned on an inscription at Karnak in Egypt that had been taken by King Ramses II, the oppressor of the Hebrews, in the time of the judges. It fell into possession of the tribe of Judah, but it was soon after retaken by the Philistines, who were not finally disposed, who were finally disposed till the time of Alexander the Great. Samson went down to this place from Timnah, slew 30 men, and took their spoil. The prophets forbid foretold their destruction. It became a Noted place in the Middle Ages, having been the scene of many a bloody battle between the Saracens and the Crusaders. It was besieged and taken by Richard the Lionhearted. And within its walls and towers now standing, he held his court. Among the Tel Amana tablets in Egypt are found letters of official dispatches from Yadaya, captain of the horse and dust of the kings of the king's feet, to the great king of Egypt, dated from Ascalon. It's now called Ascalon. So this is talking about it being taken by Alexander the Great and then other places. Ekron, that's the next one it sees over here in verse 5. Ekron, expectation of shame. The furthest north of the Philistine cities had expected had expected Tyre would withstand Alexander. And so check his progress southward through Philistia to Egypt. They This hope being confounded, put to shame, Ekron shall fear. So Ekron thought that Tyre would, stay, would stand and oppose Alexander. They didn't. So Ekron now is sorrowful because he's coming towards them. The king shall perish from Gaza, verse 5 says. The government shall be overthrown. It literally fulfillment of this, of this prophecy after a two-month siege, Gaza was taken by Alexander the Great. 10,000 of its inhabitants were slain and the rest were sold as slaves. Beltis, the satrap or petty king, was bound to a chariot by thongs, thrust through the, the soles of his feet and dragged around the city. This is what Zechariah prophesied would happen 200 years before it happened. Verse 6 is very interesting. It says, And a bastard shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. Bastard can also mean mixed races. It's one who doesn't know who his father is. So where are the Philistines today? I recently researched about where the Philistines are. People have it all wrong. They think it's the, they think it's the uh, Palestinians. They have nothing to do with the Philistines. The Palestinians are Arabs. Philistines were sea raiders from the Mediterranean. But where are they today? It says that, that he will cut off the pride of the Philistines. A bastard shall dwell in Ashdod, where the Philistines are. Well, I found an interesting recent article on who they are, who they were, and who they are today. Listen to this. This is who are the modern-day descendants of the Philistines. First, nobody knows who the Philistines were. There are various theories regarding the origin. Ranging for those who believe they came from the Aegean to those who have found evidence they may have migrated from Anatolia. Whoever they were, they became Semitized, in other words, Semitic. There's no evidence for a Philistine language. By the 7th century, they were speaking Aramaic. 
and were absorbed, bastardized into the local Canaanite population. They did not all disappear magically. They simply stopped identifying as Philistines. I will cut off the boy. I get excited when I think about this. this is from a secular article. Since they left no traces of identifiable genes, there is no way to determine which presidents and inhabitants of Palestine might have had Philistine ancestors somewhere in the distant past. So Zechariah again is giving you a history that's confirmed even by modern technology. As we go a little bit further, that mixed race is because of the pride of the Philistines. Others will migrate into the land and become the inhabitants. The land, become a, the land will become a migratory land, desolate in nature, allowing new people to mix with the Philistine population. That's exactly what happened. Now I'm all about legal Im immigration. Let me get to America for a moment. I'm the grandson of an Itali of Italian immigrants. I'm a second. I'm a second generation. Almost two thirds of America are are immigrant, are from immigrant uh, immigrant migrants. But what about the massive, unrecorded influx of Ill illegals coming out of our southern border? Is something happening in America that may make America and its Judeo Christian values disappear, like the Philippines? Are we being absorbed by something? Let me ask you. Is our current open border policy maybe similar to this? The Philistines, their language was gone, their customs were gone. Are our customs being threatened by our, our current administration and the influx of people who don't have the same ideals? The current American po population, the current immigrant immigrant population in America, as of July 2016 from 1900, is 43.7 million. It's a little blurry, but 43.7 million. Right around here is the current population of immigrants. That's including my grand. That's including my grandparents. That's the immigration from the 1900s. Look at where it's going. It's it's skyrocketing. Since 1900 to 2016, now we have 46.2 million as of November 2021. So what's happening? Are natural-born Americans being replaced? Why? Is it another part of the annihilation of our Judeo-Christian culture? It's something to think about. God wiped God wiped out the Philistine culture. From inside out. History tells us that all of these cities fell some 200 years after Zechariah prophesied of their fall by this man, Alexander the Great. This was Alexander's route. That gray, those gray, those gray arrows. This is what Zechariah says. There's the verses that Zechariah says. This is the actual historical route. If you look at history under Alexander's great route through the Middle East, you'll see him come from Syria, from Damascus. He'll take Sidon, he'll take Tyre, he'll go down, take Ashdod, he'll take Ashkelon, he'll take Gaza, he'll take Akron, but he will not take Jerusalem. That's exactly what Zechariah tells us. If you can't get excited about this, I don't know what's going on. But look what he says. I will, verse 8, encamp about my house. Though all the nations and cities surrounding Jerusalem fell to the advancing armies of Alexander, Jerusalem was spared. According to Josephus, Alexander had a dream, which was confirmed when he met the high priest. Alexander was shown the prophecies of Daniel regarding his victories over Persia. He then conferred great rights on the Jews, which other nations did not receive. Remember, Daniel wrote during Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Babylon, but he wrote about a third kingdom coming, which was, which was the Greeks. So he wrote about Alexander before Alexander was ever even born. Now watch. This is what Alexander said about his dream. And this is, this is in many historical annals. I saw this very person in a dream, in this very habit, when I was at Dios in Macedonia, it's Greece, when I was considering with myself how I might obtain the dominion of Asia. This is Alexander, wondering how he's going to conquer Asia. He exhorted me to make no delay, but boldly to pass over the sea thither, for that he would conduct my army and would give me the dominion over the Persians. you got to ask yourself a question. Who is Alexander seeing in this dream? That's telling him to go conquer the Persians. And when he went into the temple, he offered sacrifice to God. This is in Jerusalem, according to the high priest's direction, and magnificently treated both the high priest and the priests. And when the book of Daniel was shown him, where Daniel declared that one of the of the Greeks would destroy the empire of the Persians, he supposed that himself was the person intended, and as then he was glad. I believe that the person that came to Alexander the Great in his dream was Christ himself because God was rearranging and allowing history to take a point where his temple would be preserved. Now I'll read you more later. It's very fascinating. It says, my house, 
and camp about my house. The temple was preserved to the time of Messiah, who entered Jerusalem and was later sacrificed for the sins of the world. The temple was then destroyed after the Messiah was cut off in AD 30 to 29, fulfilling the words written by Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. And after three score and two weeks, 69 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, at 490 years, by the way. And the people of the prince shall that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of shall be with a flood, and the end of the war desolations are determined. So Daniel's talking about the the Messiah being cut off, Christ dying, 29 AD, and then the destruction of the temple, and then the eventual total destruction of the flood of, the, of a temple that's coming uh, with the desolations of abomination, desolations. So let me go a little bit further and give you the coming of Zion's king. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes unto thee. He's just having salvation, lowly, riding upon an ass, and upon the colt, the foal of an ass. Specific about how Christ is going to come to Jerusalem. I'll cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea, even to sea, from river even to the ends of the earth. First coming, verse 9. Second coming, verse 10. First coming, Jesus coming in on a, on a donkey. Second coming, Jesus coming in on a white horse. He's prophesying both the first coming and the second coming. As for thee also, verse 11, by the blood of thy covenant, I have set forth thy prisoners out of the pit, wherein is no water. You ought to thank God, so should I. We are the blood of the, we're from the blood of the covenant. We've been taken out of the pit. We've been taken out of hell. Turn you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even to the day I declare, do I declare that I will render double unto thee. These prisoners of hope, I'm going to tell you exactly who they are. And it's amazing. When I bent Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim, and raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as a sword of a mighty man. All right, let's look at it. Let's look at it really in detail. If ever you could get excited over prophecy, these are the verses. Again, a full 230 years before Christ's death, Zechariah tells us detailed specifics of Palm Sunday, 29 AD, and Jesus' ride to the triumphant entry. Rejoice greatly. Jerusalem is told to rejoice. Dance with force because your king comes. She said, if you didn't praise me, the very rocks would cry out. Jerusalem is to celebrate is to celebrate the entrance of its king. The first eight verses of Zechariah were in preparation for the coming of Israel's king. What king is this talking about? Your king. Here both Judaism and Christianity are in agreement. This king is the Messiah. Judaism understands this verse as return, return, referring to King Messiah who's entering Jerusalem on a donkey. They see it's going to happen in the future, but it's already happened. Christianity sees Jesus fulfilling the verse, who entered Jerusalem before his death, riding on a donkey. Matthew, say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the full of a donkey, Matthew 21, 5. They brought their donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. Very large crowds spread their cloaks on the road, while there's branches from the trees and spread them on the road. In the name of the Lord, Hosanna to the high. This is Christ fulfilling Zechariah chapter. The, co the coming king is the one who will save. He will be just and righteous and bringing salvation to the nation. The description of the righteous servant corresponds to Isaiah, where the servant killed for the sins of the world is described as the Lord's righteous servant. So is Jesus the only way to heaven? Is salvation through him the only way to heaven? You bet it is. Isaiah tells us it is. Listen, let me give you this chart. American theological views. Heaven is a place where all people ultimately be reunited with their loved ones. 60% of people believe that. Only those who trust Jesus Christ alone as their Savior receives God's free gift of eternal salvation. 
54% believe that. By the good deeds I do, I partly contribute to earning my place in heaven, which is wrong, by the way. 52%. Hell, the eternal place of judgment where God sends all people who do not personally trust in Jesus Christ. 40% agree, and they're right. Let me just tell you something. We have such a mixed understanding of what heaven is. There is only one way to get to heaven. It's through Jesus Christ, the king who rode into sa with salvation on that donkey way back when. He shall see of the travail of his soul shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant, Christ, justify many, make them as if they've never sinned. For he shall bear their iniquities. Isaiah 53, 11. It says in Zechariah 9, 3, we know that Messiah is a suffering servant, first coming. He will also come as a conquering king, second coming. We know that once he came as a on a donkey, next time he comes will be on a white horse. I want you to understand what this is. Zechariah 9 says he's lowly. Not only is the coming king just and having salvation, you're told his first coming that he's lowly, he's poor, he's afflicted, he's humble, he's wretched. How is the Messiah poor and afflicted? At what point is the Messiah in this condition? And here we see the dual, na dual nature of Christ. We see he has to come as a as a suffering Messiah. He's he's beaten by sin. He's he's accepting sin and he's defeated by sin. Sin defeats him and not doesn't stay defeated. He dies on the cross, but obviously he defeats sin eventually. But sin is the thing that put him to the cross and put him to his death. He's riding on a donkey. The description of riding on a donkey into Jerusalem, being lowly, has presented a conundrum for Jewish Messiah messianic interpretation because they don't understand it they only see christ as a conquer messiah they don't understand how he can come as a on a donkey you know why because usually when rome or any other world power captured an enemy king they'd ride him through their city their capital city on a donkey as a rejected king and a defeated king the jews can't understand that they can't line up with isaiah they could because they don't understand that christ came as a suffering service servant jesus rode to jerusalem that palm sunday in 29 AD. Not as a victorious king, but one who has been captured by sin's penalty. A servant who would bear the shame of man's sin. But the next time he comes, he comes as a conquering king on a white horse. A symbol of victory. Kings rode white horses. Look at Zechariah 9.10. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea to sea, from the river even to the ends of the earth. Chariot horses, battle bow. At the second coming, that's verse 10. The nations of the earth are gathered together against Jerusalem. It's at this point that the Jewish nation finally understands who the Messiah is. And he's none other than Jesus Christ, who entered the city on a donkey long ago at his first coming. So they call out to him, and he returns in glory and power. Paul says, all Israel shall be saved. They'll be given a choice in the, in the tribulation. They'll either follow Antichrist or they'll really follow the Christ. 144,000 will lead that revival in Israel. It says, peace to the nations, verse 10. The kingdom of Christ will be established, and peace will be brought to the nations. His dominion, dominion. Messiah's dominion, universal throughout the earth, from sea to sea. Zechariah has been telling us this for chapter after chapter. The blood of your covenant, verse 11. And all, for thee also the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit, Wherein is no water. Listen to this. The blood of the covenant. The Mosaic covenant was a foreshadowing of the new covenant, which was fulfilled by the blood of Messiah. Messiah. All the animal sacrifices were done in anticipation of the coming sacrifice. John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Prisoners of hope. Very interesting. Those who died before Christ were prisoners. They were in faith. They were prisoners of hope who were in Sheol, waiting for Christ to resurrect. He says, by the blood of the covenant, I have sent forth the prisoners out of the pit, which means they came out of that second part of hell. Hades is the one part for the wicked dead. Sheol had another part called Abraham's bosom. That's where everybody that was righteous before Christ died. You can't get to heaven without the shedding of blood. Once Jesus died, he went to, he went to hell, the Bible says, Hades. He jumped that chasm. He proclaimed captivity to the captives. The Bible says many of the dead saints, I get chills, were seen walking in Jerusalem, a mini rapture, as he resurrected them and light brought them to heaven. The prisoners came out of the pit. It's amazing. And Job 19 says this, this is what Job says. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, in the literal, my skin worms, yet in my flesh I will see God. 
man, powerful about the resurrection, your destiny and mine. He says, Judah is my bow. Judah is the Lord's instrument of war against the nations. In the end, the nations despise Judah and Jerusalem because they're a sign, they're a sign of messianic rule against the nations. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. Zechariah 14, 2. Let me finish this tonight. Zechariah 4, 9, 14. And the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning. And the Lord God shall blow the trumpet. And shall God blowing the trumpet. Can you imagine? And shall go with whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts shall defend them. They shall devour and subdue with sling stones. They shall drink and make a noise as through, as through wine. They shall be filled with, like bowls and as the corners of the altar. And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people. For they shall be as the stones of a crown lifted up as a sign upon his land. For how great is his goodness. How great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young men cheerful and new wine the maids. Okay, Zechariah has already told us to 230 years in advance of Jesus' Palm Sunday entrance into Jerusalem in 29 AD. Now he skips over 2,000 years to your future, to my future, and to the future of the world and mankind. Here's how Israel and man's struggle will end. The Lord will appear. He shall be seen. The second coming is in view as the Lord returns in glory and power to establish his kingdom over the earth. Verse 15, he'll defend them. In that day, Israel will be supernaturally empowered to defend herself against all the nations of the world, as described in Zechariah 12, 8. The Lord himself will be the power behind the people. Verse 16, God will save them. When Christ returns, the nations will know that Jesus is the Messiah. He was God in the flesh. who died on the cross for the sins of the nation. In that day, the nation will be restored to the Lord. All Israel shall be saved. The people are called the flock of his people, and the Lord is the shepherd and Messiah. They're described as jewels of a crown, because it's at this point, God is able to, to bless an obedient people who now know their sin and their Messiah. Through Israel, the Lord will bless the nations as King Messiah rules and reigns over the earth from Jerusalem. Verse 17, how great, man. We need to say it over and over again. How great. The Messianic era will surpass any period known on earth. In beauty and in glory, the people will radiate, both men and women. Both grain and wine will be a blessing to humanity in the ages to come. Look, week after week in our study of Zechariah, he's been motivating and prophesying to his people in 520 BC. But don't miss it. He's also, pro also prophesying and motivating us as we need the close of 2022 AD. The Lord's kingdom is coming. We are extremely close. Even the secular know it. I read you the article today. Zechariah wants you to think about and meditate on his words. So what must I build up before he comes? Well, to those 6th century BC followers, it was the temple of Solomon that they had to build up. To us today, it's to build up the temple of the Holy Ghost, to get excited, to understand that he's coming. I rarely do this, but I want to close with the historian Josephus, who wrote about Alexander the Great's approach to Jerusalem in a direct fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9. He, had, he, had, he was just talking about history. And listen to what this historian said. Now Alexander, when he had been taken when he had taken Gaza, made haste to go up to Jerusalem. And Judea, the high priest, uh, Jadua, the high priest, when he heard that, was in agony and under terror, as not knowing how he should meet the Macedonians, since the king was displeased at his foregoing disobedience. He therefore ordained that the people should make supplications, should join with him in offering sacrifice to God, whom he besought to protect the nation and to deliver them from the perils ever coming upon them. Let me stop here. So we know that the high priest Jadua was not paying tribute to, to um, Alexander the Great. He also knew that Alexander the Great was coming, was going to destroy Jerusalem. So he starts to tell people, let's talk, let's speak to God. Let's offer our sacrifices to God. Um, he says that where God warned him in a dream, which came upon him after he had offered sacrifices to the high priest, that he should take courage. And adorn the city and open the gate, something unheard of, that the rest should appear in white garments, and that he and the priest should meet the king, Alexander, in the habits proper to the order, without the dread of any ill consequences, which the providence of God would prevent. Upon which, when he rose from his sleep, the king, the king, uh, king uh, Jadua, he greatly rejoiced and, de and declared to all the warning he had received from God, according to which the dream he had acted entirely. And so he waited for the coming of, of King Alexander. 
And when he understood that Alexander was not part of the city, he went out in procession with the priests and the multitude of the citizens. The procession was venerable, and the manner of it different from that of other nations. It reached to a place called Safa, which name translated into Greek signifies a prospect. For you have hence a prospect both of Jerusalem and of the temple. And the Phoenicians and the Chaldeans that followed him, through, though they should have liberty to plunder the city and torment the high priest to death, which the king's displeasure fairly promised them, the very reverse happened. For Alexander, when he saw the multitude at a distance in white garments, while the priest stood clothed with fine linen, and the high priest in purple and scarlet clothing with a mitre on his head, having a golden plate upon where the name of God was engraved, he approached by himself and, and adored that name and first saluted the high priest. This is Alexander the Great saluting the high priest. The Jews also did all together with one voice salute Alexander and encompass him about, whereupon the kings of Syria and the rest were surprised at what Alexander had done and supposed him dis disordered in his mind. However, Parmenio alone went up to him and asked him how it came to pass that he, when all the others adored him, he should adore the high priest of the Jews. To whom Alexander replied, I do not adore him, but that God who has honored him with his high priesthood. For I saw this very person in a dream, in this very habit when I was at Dios in Macedonia, who when I was considering with myself how I might obtain the dominion of Asia, exhorted me to make no delay, but boldly pass over the sea hither, so that he would conduct my army and would give me the dominion over the Persians. Whence it is that having seen no other in that habit, and now seeing this person in it, and remembering that vision, and the exhortation which I had in my dream, I believe that I bring this army under the divine conduct of God, and shall therewith conquer Darius, and destroy the power of the Persians, and that all things will succeed according to what is in my own hand. And when he had said this to Parmenia, and had given the high priest his right hand, the priest long, ran along by him, came into the city, when he went up into the temple, Alexander offered sacrifices to God according to the high priest's direction and magnificently treated both the high priest and the priests. And when the book of Daniel was showed him, wherein Daniel declared that one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians, he supposed that himself was the per person intended. And as he was then glad, he dismissed the multitude of the present. But the next day he called them to him and he did ask what favors to please them. Whereupon the high priest desired they might enjoy the laws of their forefathers and might pay no tribute on the seventh year and continue to build the tabernacle. He granted all they desired. And when they entreated him that he would permit the Jews in Babylon and Media to enjoy their own laws also, he willingly promised to do hereafter what they asked. And when he said to the multitude that if any of them would enlist themselves in his army on this, on this condition, that they should continue under the laws of their forefathers and live according to them, he was willing to take them with him. Many were ready to accompany him in his wars. Unbelievable. Unbelievable powerful. God had his hand in the affairs of man, the great affairs of man. How much more so does he have his hand in your affairs and in your life? Tonight, let me just pray with you. Father, again, I thank you and praise you. Not only for Zechariah, the powerful prophecy, Christ's first coming, his soon second coming. But Lord, the confirmation through historians, Lord. And even Alexander the Great. I have no idea what happened to Alexander the Great, how he ended up. But this moment, this day, he honored the God of heaven. He honored Jehovah. I thank you, Lord God, that you spared the city and the temple so that Christ could come with salvation. Bless us this day. Bless our families as we approach Christmas, Lord God, the start of it all. May your blessing continue to reside in every household. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Shalom again. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas and your family.